good evening good afternoon um, um, or good morning uh, wherever you are it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to this uh, 98th webinar of this webinar series of spin tonics on behalf of my entire w2s team i welcome you welcome you all uh, to this lecture of uh, professor hai peng ding who is a very well known name of uh, spin tonics and have really done some wonderful work in the field of uh, spin tonics and i'm really glad that you accepted uh, our kind invitation a very uh, very nice of you thank you so much and i'm also thankful to many participants uh, who are attending today for joining and uh, having some yeah, i'm sure we will have some nice interactions later on. so uh, i think our attending is very well known still for the benefit of students i will say a few words about him uh, professor ding received his uh, bachelor of science from tianjin university uh, in 1995 that he uh, obtained his uh, masters uh, from fudan university in 1998 subsequently he got his phd in physics from uh, martin luther university and max planck institute for microstructural physics at halle in germany Uh, so he did his postdoctoral at material science division at Argonne National Laboratory uh, until 2005, and in 2006 he joined the Nanjing University as a full professor and is working there uh, since then. His research is uh, quite, uh, you know, broad, working on several important areas, but um, one can say mainly focused on low-dimensional magnetism, including the self-assembled and artificially built magnetic atomic structures. growth of magnetic films and multi layers pure spin current transport and topological magnetism he served as the international advisory board of the jet uh, on between 2017 to 2022 and a senior review board of ieee magnetic status uh, since 2021 he chaired the magnetism and spin tonics sub conference of the annual conference of chinese physics society since 2007 and he is currently the chair of the nanjing chapter Of the IEEE Magnetic Society, so uh, I know you have done wonderful work and contributed a lot on this uh, spin to charge conversion physics, and actually going to some very fundamental aspects. And that's kind of title you have put today. It's uh, really nice of you, uh, I think. Uh, I just like to mention briefly that uh, we don't take any questions during the lecture. So if you have any question, you can kindly write in the chat box, or at the end of the lecture, you raise your hand and. then we will uh, unmute you and you can ask a question directly to the speaker and we will discuss with you and at the end of the lecture we will take a photo and okay. uh, then a small memento uh, and uh, yeah then we can conclude uh, so i'm really looking forward to you uh, to the lecture hi thing and i request all of the participants to mute or we, uh, the uh, the moderator will uh, mute uspendra Uh, and i actually i forgot i, I should mention my team uh, they have really done a wonderful job in uh, helping me in doing this and pushpendra is a very nice helping hand at the and others raj and yeah so please uh, continue hyping it's all yours looking forward to a lecture okay uh, good evening ladies and gentlemen um uh, my name is hyping team from nanji university And thank you for attending my talk. Uh, today, I would like to share with you uh, uh, selected fundamental aspects about the pure spin current. And uh, here's the the outline of my talk. So first, I will give you a short introduction. So why we are interested in pure spin current. And after that, I will discuss uh, more details about uh, two specific topics. One is about this uh, spin and the charge co conversion efficiency quantification, and the second one is that uh, how we can distinguish this bulk or surface contribution on this uh, inverse spin hole effect. And uh, if time allows, I will discuss a little bit more on this uh, anomalous inverse spin uh, hole effect. Okay, so as we know that uh, in the past uh, 60s, that uh, semiconductor industry has tremendous uh, developments. Essentially, it follows this uh, so-called Morse law. So namely, so the transistor density is 
uh, in the chip doubles every two years. And now it's going close to this uh, in a nanometer range. It cannot uh, continue anymore, this Moore's law. Um, meanwhile, you can look at the, on the bottom, there's a clock speed, which is essentially at the beginning, it follows uh, this uh, Moore's law as well. However, it's going to saturate around 2004. The reason for that is because when the frequency gives a fuller increase, that uh, the device becomes too hot, it cannot maintain its function anymore. And due to this heat problem, I will give you one example. For instance, the typical example is that uh, the CPU is too hot, you can easily use it to fry your egg. And one has to think about other solutions. As we know that uh, in the uh, semiconductor in industry, we use this uh, charge property of electrons to transfer the information. However, as we know, electron contains both charge and the spin degree of freedom. If we can use both properties, we might be able to uh, create more functionalities. And as well, in particular, if we use this uh, spin uh, property, this can reduce this power consumption significantly. And this is the uh, spintronics. Uh, Spintronics started uh, from this uh, discovery of this giant magneto resistance effect, which is about uh, in the late 1980s. So this opens the door to entire new technology field, so-called Spintronics. Uh, this the two gentlemen, Albert Furt, uh, Peter Greenberg, uh, they discovered this GMI effect and they won both uh, won this uh, Nobel Prize in 2007. And I think uh, Professor Furt also gives a talk on this uh, webinar. And after more than 30 years, actually Spintronics enter a new uh, stage, uh, so-called uh, pure spin current. So in the, uh, let me explain a little bit more on this pure spin current. So in a charge current, we don't care about this, uh, the spin orientation of these electrons because we mainly utilize these charge properties. And, uh, and in that case, that uh, uh, spin up and spin down are more or less balanced. However, for instance, we, if we have 10 electrons, if six of them are point, has the spin point up, four of them have the spin direction point down, and resulting there's two net uh, spin information is so-called spin points current. This is a, at the beginning that spin tronics is mainly utilized. And so in addition to passing this 10 electrons information, we are also passing this two spin information additionally, so as we know, there's uh, less electrons are involved and less energy consumption is needed, okay? And let me put it into one extreme case. If we have one electron with the spin up uh, moving towards uh, to the right and one electron with spin down moving towards to the left, and essentially this can pass the two spin informations and that uh, this is so-called pure spin current. There's no net charge current and we can pass this information exactly the same with this 10 electrons, but we, so far we only use two electrons. So it will uh, reduce this power consumption considerably. And th this is one type of pure spin current. There's another type of pure spin current, so called spin wave. This is uh, due to this, uh, uh, it can trans, due to this angular, uh, it can transfer this uh, angular momentum through this uh, spin wave propagation. And this can happen in this uh, uh, magnetic uh, insulators. Uh, in that, we don't have, don't need involved there's any electron movements, so there's no heating, so this power consumption can be even lower. The pure spin current, the, 
people already discovered many applications. Here I list uh, some of them. For instance, you can use a pure spin current to switch a magnetization without uh, passing a large current into your uh, fellow magnet layer. It's so-called spin orbital torque switching. And uh, you can use also use pure spin current to harvest the uh, thermal energy where really it's so-called uh, spin uh, seaback effect. And uh, you can also use the pure spin current to create its uh, uh, magno, magno logics and logic devices to perform these oper uh, logic operations. And uh, you can also use uh, pure spin current to generate its trucks uh, emission with high efficiency. So this is uh, only a uh, only list of uh, several applications. I believe many of, uh, of applications are waiting for you and for us to fully explore. And I also uh, explained to you that a few uh, that's a pure spin current generation and detection. Essentially, there's so for pure spin current generation, there's uh, several methods. Here is uh, uh, we can use spin hole effect when we injected a uh, uh, charge current into a uh, heavy metal due to the spin orbital coupling, the spin up and spin down electrons are scattered differently. Uh, in particular, along this uh, uh, longitudinal direction, spin up and spin down electrons are scattered towards the opposite direction, it's created a net pure spin current. This can be described by this formula. And uh, this is one type of pure spin current generation. We can also use this technique so-called spin pumping. We excited a microwave to use a microwave to excite it uh, magnetization precision. And with this uh, precision, we can generate a pure spin current into the next layer adjacent to this uh, uh, magnetic layer. And uh, we can also use this uh, thermal effect, use the temperature gradient to generate it, uh, pure spin current. And uh, this is our three main techniques to generate a pure spin current. For the detection of the pure spin current, we many use this inverse spin hole effect. It is a uh, uh, inversion effect of this uh, uh, spin hole effect. Essentially, we injected a pure spin current uh, due to the same mechanism, elect spin up and spin down electrons are scattered towards to the same direction result a charge current. Uh, okay, after this short introduction, uh, I will come to the uh, real parts that uh, uh, the first topic is this uh, spin and charge conversion efficiency quantification. Uh, above, I mentioned these two techniques, which is commonly used for this uh, pure spin current generation, uh, spin, uh, pure spin current detection. Uh, you can find it for this, they essentially described uh, this one number, which is uh, very critical to describe this uh, spin charge coefficient, so-called spin hole angle. If this uh, number is large, it's much easier to detect the pure spin current, and it's much easier to detect the spin hole, uh, the pure uh, generate pure spin current. So it is a key parameter for spin current based applications. And people are interesting for this the measurement of this pure spin current. Here I listed a few examples. Um, on this uh, left figure, this is for the protein case. Uh, on the horizontal axis, we marked it. Uh, we, this is a spin diffusion lens. And uh, on the vertical axis, this spin hole angle. You see that uh, among many different groups uh, measuring these uh, two numbers, uh, unfortunately, the different groups use different numbers. Uh, for spin hole angle, they scattered by more than one order of magnitude. magnitude. And uh, for the spin diffusion lens, it's also scattered more than one order of magnitude. Here, I, would like, I also marked the typical mean free pass of protein here, which is about four or five nanometer. And uh, from the spin dependent uh, scattering theory, uh, 
that uh, spin diffusion lens must larger than this uh, mean free parts. So even we're talking about the uh, skip it least parts, uh, looking on this uh, on the right parts here, still the data are scattered differently. So uh, very largely, this is for platinum case. And this similar case can be founded for the palladium case as well. And um, for this bull, uh, even people using the same technique, for instance, or for spin pumping technique, they get different numbers. And um, we are also interested in this uh, topic because this is a very important measurement, okay? And however, we have to solve this uh, several key issues. First, we have to figure out what is this criterion for the spin hole angle quantification. Uh, if we simply did a measurement, do a measurement, we only contribute not a number, uh, the other people don't trust us. What is the, this is the real measurements, okay? And um, however, when we plot this figure, we realize that. So when we are talking about the spin hole angle, we usually refers to a non-magnetic material itself, for instance, platinum or palladium, okay? And so it's spin hole angle, it is an intrinsic parameter of a non-magnetic material. And in a real measurements, however, we usually need a, a ferromagnetic layer attached to it, use it as a pure spin current source, okay? And uh, so we can think about if we can change this uh, ferromagnetic layer to ferromagnetic with different Material, we use ferromagnetic layer one, ferromagnetic uh, layer two, and ferromagnetic layer three as the measurements. Then that uh, measure the spin hole angle should be independent with this ferromagnetic layer itself, uh, it used. So we can use this as the criterion for the spin hole angle quantific quantification, however, when we're talking about this bilayer system, it is well known, it will create an interface between this non-magnetic layer and the ferromagnetic layer. Then the second issue we need to address is how can we characterize this uh, interface effect? Besides, when we look at the, on, uh, the details of the previous studies, we found that people actually are not uh, measuring this really the true spin pumping signals. I will explain a little more in the details here, but before I will explain some basics about this ferromagnetic resonance and the spin pumping effect. Uh, for uh, ferromagnetic resonance, we use IFU to excite it, uh, the ferromagnetic uh, processing of the ferromagnetic uh, magnetization uh, essentially it can be described by this number of this Gilbert equation. And so there's two terms. This uh, first term is brings this into the circular position. And the second term is the damping term, brings the magnetization back to the magnetization if the I field is turned off. And uh, this is, it depends to uh, the uh, external field, and the uh, ferromagnetic material is it's, um, IF field uh, frequency. And uh, when it can hit to the resonance condition, can be described if it's without a magnetic any such a B, it can be described by this formula. Okay. And uh, essentially, uh, the microwave absorption spectrum has followed this behavior like this. It's uh, at the resonance reach to its maximum. And it also follows Lorentzian symmetric line shape. And there's uh, the line waves of this uh, uh, spectrum is uh, uh, defined uh, by this, uh, from this line waves, we can measure this damping constants, okay? And this is uh, one layer itself. If we adding a, a non-magnet layer attached to it, so this will, a soft that pure injected uh, spin current uh, into this non-magnetic layer. And uh, as a 
we can see the response of this phenomenic layer. And so this uh, will create its additional damping. So this is a, uh, this absorption curve will has a slightly change. One typical feature is this, the line width will become wider and this peak will becomes uh, a little bit, uh, amplitude becomes a little bit less, okay? And this is the response of this phylomatic layer. There's also response of this non-magnetic layer, okay? So for the non when we injected a pure spin color into this non-magnetic layer, it creates a spin charge conversion and generated a pure uh, charge current, which can be measured by through this multimeter. And in this case, that's a pure spin current is along this C direction, that the spin, uh, the spin axis is parallel with the magnetization orientation and the charge current and can be described by this uh, formula. If we use the IF field, which is perpendicular to the interface, we can have this uh, sign dependence. Since this is also uh, proportional to this magnetization orientation, so it follows this uh, Lorentzian uh, symmetric line shape. Uh, this sine theta, because only this uh, magnetization perpendicular to the uh, uh, charge current direction contribute to this charge, contribute to this spin charge conversion, uh, conversion. So we only have this sign dip, theta dependence. With this, we can draw this the feature of this, uh, uh, measure this charge uh, signal. It should have symmetric Lorentzian line shape and also should have anti-symmetric waste uh, magnetic field. Typically it has this, uh, this feature. And this is for the IF field perpendicular to the interface. We can also measure it with IF field within the sample plane. And then this is, will add slightly uh, complete, uh, complexity. And also, however, it can be also, uh, if we keep in mind only the IF field perpendicular to the magnetization can contribute to the precession of the uh, magnetization. So then in this case, we can obtain this uh, spin pumping voltage, which is proportional to this sine theta and the cosine theta uh, square dependence. Uh, with this, this also had this uh, symmetric Lorentzian line shape and the symmetric with the external field. So this is the characteristic feature of the spin pumping induced inverse spin hole effect. It has followed this line, okay? However, when we look at the literatures, people's measurements, they only list some of them. You will see the signal actually contains both the symmetric and anti-symmetric parts. And what's the reason for that? Because uh, there's a so-called uh, spin rectification effect. Here I use the AMR as an example to explain a little bit more. Uh, because uh, in a, we use a ferromagnetic metal, it has a famous effect, so-called uh, angular mag magneto resistance effect. So the, magnet, the resistance depends on the uh, magnetization orientation with, re with respect to the current direction used for measuring this uh, resistance. And uh, if we have a microwave excitation, the magnetization is actually is a dynamic magnetization. So the resistance, this uh, uh, theta pi is also dynamic. So it has a time dependence. Uh, so the resistance is also time dependent. Now, if we have a current into it, it contains both static parts and RF parts, RF current. And uh, so when we're measuring the voltage, it is uh, the time average of this resistance times this uh, uh, current, okay? And now if we only have this uh, uh, static current, we're measuring this AMI effect. If we only have this IF current, we're measuring this uh, 
AMI induced the spin regulation effect, okay? And because it has a psi, psi is the phase difference between this magnetization and the IF current. And then we would have this both uh, symmetric, anti-symmetric Lorentzian line shape. And then this is, uh, if we have both this uh, static current and this IF current, and then we had, uh, this is a so-called microwave photo resistance effect. This is also a very important measurement because we can use it to measuring this processing angle alpha one and beta one, okay? And since that's due to this, as I explained before, that uh, since it has a phase shift, it contains both symmetric and anti-symmetric components, then it, uh, if we sum up both, then that's a real line shape becomes complicated. Okay, this is a break curve contains both uh, symmetric and anti-symmetric parts. Okay, this explains previous uh, results. And if you keep it uh, remind that, um, memorize that for spin pumping uh, induced inverse spin high voltage, it has only the symmetric lung shape and uh, has it is anti-symmetric with the external field. However, we cannot simply remove of this anti-symmetric parts uh, uh, from that measure signal because uh, the spin rectification effect contains both this anti-symmetric and uh, symmetric Lorentzian line shape. And however, when we look at it, because they have different angular uh, dependence for spin rectification effect, assigned to theta, and uh, spin pumping is a sine theta dependence. And that uh, we can pick up specific angles, for instance, at uh, zero and 180 degree and uh, plus or minus 90 degree, both the, uh, there's AMR uh, induced the uh, spin reaction effect is all goes to the zero. However, when we had uh, uh, spin pumping signals at the positive and then negative, uh, 90 degree and the spin pumping voltage actually goes, which is positive and negative maximum. So we can pick up this specific uh, geometry. We have I field perpendicular excitation. We measure it at positive and um, negative, a plus or minus 90 degree. We can obtain this pure spin pumping signal because there's a spin reactive action effect goes to the zero. And this is the way uh, found this geometry in uh, 2012. And here's the, the details. We use the CPW. And uh, here's the signal line, here's the ground line. We place our sample in between this uh, signal line and the ground line. And here we mainly have this perpendicular excitation. On the right is the sketch of the measurement. And uh, in the center here is the a picture of the real sample, and we use a network analyzer to generate it uh, microwave into our CPW. And we also use the locking amplifier to uh, switch on this uh, microwave with on and off with the high frequency. And this is why also very important because we can remove the thermal effect, okay? And uh, here's, you see that now with a positive 90 degree, we have the uh, independent ways, there's a different frequency is used. We always obtain this uh, symmetric Lorentzian line shape and with the negative, the signal reversed. Okay, so this is the characteristic of the pure spin pumping signals. And I also would like to point it out. If we're measuring this uh, platinum, we always obtain the pure, uh, the uh, positive signals because the uh, spin whole angle of the plotting is positive when we're measuring to the tantalum because the spin whole angle is negative. And uh, that uh, it's always obtained as uh, negative the signal, okay? And also I would like to point it out, uh, besides this AMR, uh, this planar hole effect and the anomalous hole effect can also contribute to this spin 
rectification effect because uh, it also depends on the magnetization. If you are interested, we have these two papers. I recommend you to look at these two papers. Okay. And uh, I would like to also address this interface effect. Uh, for to address the interface effect, we call use this a model developed by Su Fen Zhang and Dr. Uh, Kai Chen from U University of Arizona. Essentially, they pointed out when we injected uh, a pure spin current from the non magnet uh, from the ferromagnetic layer into the non magnet like non magnetic layer it was suffers so-called interface spin loss, okay? So in such case that uh, we would have uh, the, that the spin charge conversion from this non-magnetic layer, from this interface layer, and also from this ferromagnetic layer itself. So it has three parts, okay? And in addition, when we're taking, their model also taking into account the spin back flow, and they found that a spin mixing conduct effective spin mixing conductance can be a very good method to characterize this uh, interface spin loss. Okay, and we uh, for the real uh, measurements we adopt this model. However, we also made a modification. We found it uh, the contribution from this ferromagnetic layer itself as the is very small. Is negligible small, so we only contains two times. And uh, in addition, uh, we also uh, modified uh, this uh, the voltage is proportional to resistance of the non magnetic layer itself. Okay, and since this, we're measuring that uh, uh, both the spin missing conductance as the, and also this uh, spin pumping voltage as function of the non magnetic layer, uh, layer thickness. And we use a different ferromagnetic layer. Here's I show you the results. You see that uh, uh, for we use uh, pomeroy and cobalt and cobalt iron, three different material as the uh, pure spin current source. And we're measuring that the spin hole angle of platinum. And for spin mixing conductance, the they behave very differently, and uh, they show especially at the very thin end. So you see that at a very thin end for pomeroy, it's almost a constant here. Um, for cobalt, a platinum case, it shows gradually increase. And uh, for cobalt iron, it is also behave different, something in between these two cases. And so this is this uh, spin mixing uh, effect. Is, uh, spin mixing conductance can serve as very good tool to colorize this interface effect. And uh, we plot this too, and as function of the non-magnetic layer thickness dependence, uh, we use this two formula is to fit uh, uh, all the data. Essentially, we only have four parameter uh, spin interface spin loss number. Uh, if this delta is one, there's complete loss. If delta is zero, then it is, there's no loss. And there's a spin hole angle, Let's look at the results. For independent of this uh, uh, three systems, we all obtained the same uh, spin hole angle of within the experimental accuracy. This 0.03 for platinum, and we're also measuring this uh, spin diffusion length, which is about a nanometer, compared with the mean free pass, which is about double. So it is larger than that uh, than the mean free pass. Uh, also, I also would like to point out the spin hole angle we measured is a, uh, fit, uh, has a nice agreement with this uh, uh, theoretic uh, calculation by the first pr principle calculation. Okay, this is uh, for platinum case. And uh, we also measured for palladium case. We found it essentially the spin, measured spin hole angle is also independent as so with this pomeroy, cobalt, and uh, cobalt iron. Essentially, it is the same number we obtain. Okay. And for the spin hole angle for palladium, which is uh, much uh, larger, uh, much smaller than the platinum case. However, one interesting 
we found this at uh, least two systems for cobalt palladium and uh, pomeroy palladium, the interface spin loss is essentially more or less zero. And this is uh, uh, in good agreement because uh, previously people found palladium is also a uh, very good uh, material can be used for the spin orbital torque switching, uh, probably uh, due to this high transparency of pure spin current, okay? And then I will come to the second part, how to distinguish this, uh, whether it is bulk or the surface effect. Uh, previously, I explained to you this uh, spin hole effect and the inverse spin hole effect. This is a, uh, uh, this are uh, bulk effect. Besides the bulk effect, there's also interface effect can also contribute it to the spin and uh, charge conversion, interconversion. Essentially, we can use the, the same figure to describe this uh, spin charge conversion. Um, however, it's very difficult to distinguish this, whether it is uh, coming from the bulk or the, uh, it is a surface effect. I will explain a little bit more on this uh, large bar Einstein effect, okay? And uh, so that uh, uh, when we had a large bar type of uh, band splitting, the Hamiltonian can be written like this, it's proportional to this uh, large bar constant alpha r, and the proportion to the cross bar product of a momentum K and the spin uh, direction, and also proportional to the uh, potential uh, gradient across the interface. Uh, with this momentum, uh, with this ad additional ha Hamiltonian, the uh, original, uh, it will remove the degeneracy of the uh, band and creates a spin up band and spin down bands like this. When we had a cut across the Fermi level, you found it a spin momentum locking like this. For this inner uh, circle, it has a quarter-crisis rotation. Uh, for the uh, outer one, it has the opposite quarter, uh, uh, rotation sense. And now if we injected pure spin current, actually, for instance, spin up uh, current will create the population of the spin up electrons. Okay. And then that, uh, this will result in unbalanced, uh, there's a spin up and spin down electrons, unbalanced. Uh, actually will create a charge a current. This is uh, spin, creates a spin charge conversion, this so-called inverse large bar at Einstein effect. Okay, because it is an interface effect, so it has a great tunability, you can tune the interface to tune this large bar at Einstein effect. Okay. Uh, prove that uh, I also would like to point out uh, one can distinguish this interface effect uh, because uh, if by through this stacking order, there is a potential difference also reversed. So this Hamiltonian change its sign. So this uh, uh, rotation sense also change its sign with the uh, spin charge conversion also reverse. And if you are interested, we, you can look at the, into this paper. Okay. Uh, however, in the literature, there's a hot debate on whether uh, it is, it is uh, uh, in, uh, in, inverse large bar Einstein effect or if it is the inverse spin hole effect on this silver bismuth. Actually, this is the uh, first system discovered for the reported for the IRE effect. Okay. And uh, uh, they compare the spin pumping of this uh, silver into the silver and the bismuth or silver bismuth by layers, they found a strong enhancement. And uh, it's hard to understand why this enhancement, okay? And uh, because uh, in the literature, 
uh, for if people adopt uh, one third monolayer of bismuth on silver, they found that uh, use the photo emission to find a large uh, rush bar band scraping, which is a uh, rush bar coefficient, which is about a three. Right. This is called a Jiang rush bar uh, effect. Okay. Band splitting. And how there are people, many reports relied on this to expand their experimental results. However, uh, uh, Professor Charlin's group, they used as a different techniques uh, that are spin feedback. They used that uh, magnetic insulator egg uh, as the spin current source. They found that this, the spin charge conversion is almost vanishing. And uh, also, uh, people uh, use this uh, reverse stacking order, for instance, uh, between this bismuth and the silver. And now that the silver bismuth, they compare this uh, spin pumping with the opposite stacking order. The spin pumping signal, uh, they show the same sign, which is uh, contradicted to the characteristic feature of the IRE effect, okay? So there's a controversy about uh, on the previous reports on silver and basement system, people claim that it's a IRE dominant in silver basement interface. Or uh, some people claim there's no negligible small spin charge conversion. And also some people claim this is a, inverse spin hole effect dominant at, in this silver business system. So we also look at to this system. The key technique we use uh, is developed by uh, Professor Xiaofeng Jin's group. They uh, use this uh, uh, tri-layer uh, sandwich system, the silver business sandwich by two ferromagnetic layer. Uh, if they, uh, uh, use the uh, spin pumping. If there's two ferromagnetic layer are different, they can select it at the pumping conditions. So the cu spin current can be pumped either from the top into this silver uh, bismuth by layer or from the bottom into it. And because there's a pure spin current, uh, if it's a rush for IRE dominant, it will show a double peak feature. If it's it was spin hole effect dominant, it was, see this uh, pick and dip uh, feature, okay? We essentially use this uh, technique uh, to measure it. How about we do something different? Okay, instead of, uh, we first uh, repeat the measurements, uh, their measurements, we found that iron, you will use the iron and uh, pomeroy, uh, both are phenomenic uh, met metals. We found it also, pick and uh, dip, okay? However, when we replace iron with a magnetic insulator, like an egg, okay? We found this is a double pick feature. And according to this uh, criterion, then there's a object uh, behavior, an uh, object conclusion can be drawn, can be either, uh, dominated by this inverse spin hole effect or dominated by the inverse rush by this effect. So there must be other effects which we need to take into account. And possible issue is, could be that the inverse spin hole effect in the metallics film should be taken into account. And the second thing, it could be that interface effect between the ferromagnetic layer or ferromagnetic insulator and uh, and silver bismuth, okay? We will address these two issues. Okay, so we replace, first replace this permaloy uh, to, uh, with this iron nickel alloy, we tune this composition. The reason why that is uh, uh, nickel has a positive spin hole angle and uh, iron has the negative spin hole angle with we tune the magnetization, uh, their uh, composition, we found it as uh, X equals 0 0.35. This uh, spin hole angle goes to the zero. There's a crossing point here. 
and then we use this, we replace this as a, a iron nickel alloy at uh, uh, this composition, we found it still, it has the double peak uh, feature. So it is indicated as it is a IIE dominant uh, effect. However, we, when we look at uh, more details, we look at all this uh, interface between uh, this privilege, which realized this egg and the silver bismuth uh, by, uh, by layer, so it's almost no contribution. However, when we added iron ni nickel, and we found it, it has this uh, double pick features, okay? And when we replace, we stripping the staking order of silver bismuth and uh, iron nickel alloy into here, we found that it's a double pick, uh, reverses its sign. And especially when we look at uh, this uh, pick, uh, this is a resonance pick of the egg. This means there's spin current passing through this uh, interface. And this indicates this, uh, clearly demonstrate that uh, it is a uh, uh, IRE effect at the interface between this silver bismuth and the phenomatic layer. And uh, we also perform the uh, staking order, uh, reverse the staking order between silver and bismuth into uh, bismuth silver, essentially it shows the same sign. okay? So we demonstrate this is a uh, uh, IRE uh, dominant, contribution from that uh, silver bismuth uh, and uh, phenomatic layer, uh, phenomatic metal interface. Okay, besides we also replace this uh, uh, phenomatic uh, layer, we found it use iron and uh, compare with iron and iron nickel or alloy, perm alloy and the nickel, we found it, uh, we can tune this uh, spin charge conversion. And uh, this is also uh, a good demonstrate this is a, a interface effect. So it is a, a IRE dominant contribution. Okay, for the new experimental funding is, we demonstrate is a strong IRE at the interface between the silver bismuth with a phenomatic metal, but not with a phenomatic insulator. This is clearly different with this previously reported that uh, IRE dominant at the silver bismuth interface or inverse spin hoyle dominant in the silver bismuth system. However, there's still remaining puzzles. There's why there's no apparent IRE at the silver bismuth interface because uh, even there's a silver bismuth uh, large uh, Jiang Rajpa uh, band splitting uh, found experimentally. And the second thing, what is the origin of the IRE between this the silver bismuth and the phenomatic metal? For this, we go to our theoretical uh, collaborators. Okay, this is uh, uh, Professor Zhe Yin from Beijing Normal University. First, uh, he made a first principle calculation and uh, repeated this one third layer of, of bismuth on silver 111. He found large uh, band splitting the, with the large, obtained the large bar coefficient with op, uh, 2.9, which is has nice agreement uh, with this experimental found value of 3.05. Okay, this band splitting is uh, essentially reproduced that uh, uh, the photo emission results. Okay, and however, when we slightly Add more uh, bismuth into it. Uh, we found it uh, bismuth has e it's easily form alloy with this uh, silver when we add more bismuth, and uh, he also calculated the bands with this intermixing system, and he found it from the band structure this wash bar band disappeared, okay? So this kills this wash bar band splitting or also kills this uh, IRE effect, okay? 
uh, he also calculated, uh, we also look at other on the experiments through this cross section TM. We found it, uh, this is the result here for the bismuth. We found it, uh, there's a strong diffusion on the bismuth across the whole layer. So there's a strong uh, intermixing of uh, silver and the bismuth. Essentially, it kills that uh, the IE effect. Okay. Uh, he also made a calculation for this uh, uh, business uh, nickel interface. Um, he found that even with this uh, uh, intermixed uh, interface, he still found that uh, large bar band splitting, which is about uh, uh, 0 0.9, uh, or, and there's another band above the Fermi level, which is about 1.7. Okay, so even with this uh, intermixing, that uh, rust band, band still maintains. Okay, uh, also put it uh, silver into add some silver onto it. And we found uh, interesting that silver actually uh, will enhance this watch bar band splitting this experimental or uh, experimental results that uh, with the nickel interface, we found a very large IRE effect. Okay, also I would like to point it out that uh, in front of nature, we might behave like a blind person. We only see part of the picture. However, together with previous uh, investigations, uh, in a joint effort, we can catch the whole picture. If you are interested in, you may look into this uh, paper. Okay, finally, I would like to uh, touch a little bit on this enormous inverse spin hole effect. Okay, and uh, in a, uh, as we know that if we have a, a used uh, ordinary uh, metal or semiconductor, we can, uh, if it's a non-magnetic, we can measure in this so-called Hall effect, okay? Uh, if we measuring this, uh, use, uh, replace it with a magnetic metal, we can measure the so-called enormous Hall effect. So if we have a uh, non-magnetic material, uh, metal, we can measure in this so-called spin Hall effect. And if we replace this non-magnetic metal with a ferromagnetic metal, can we see this uh, enormous spin hall effect? Okay, and actually, that uh, my friend Professor uh, Shannon Wang from Hong Kong University, he made uh, based on the symmet uh, uh, symmetry analysis, uh, he developed a theory. He pointed out actually there's a uh, two kind of uh, uh, that's enormous spin hole effect can be detected. Uh, that uh, in this uh, both cases, uh, the enormous uh, spin hole effect, uh, the characteristic feature is that the uh, charge current and spin current, they still need to be orthogonal to each other. However, the uh, spin can be either parallel with the pure spin current direction or parallel with this charge current direction. Uh, so this is a characteristic feature. Okay, so in our, in, today I will only focus on this, uh, the second case, okay? Okay, uh, let me uh, put in this, uh, the different feature of this uh, spin hole effect and the in, enormous uh, inverse spin hole effect. As I mentioned previously to you that uh, uh, for the inverse spin hole effect, that the uh, spin current direction and charge current direction and the spin axis, they need to be also corner to each other. And uh, the measurement should be independent of with the magnetization. And uh, for the uh, features of the enormous inverse spin hole effect, that the uh, charge current and spin current, they still need to perpendicular to each other. However, the spin axis can be parallel with this charge current or the pure spin current direction. And the second feature is if we flip the magnetization from, from up to down, 
the uh, generated charge current or spin current, they also need to flip its sign. Uh, there's a third feature is that uh, uh, the converted charge of spin current, they need to proportion to the magnetization, okay? And here's the measurement results. For the sample, we use uh, IG, which has an imprint magnetization. And uh, for the detection, we use a copper palladium multi-layer, which has a perpendicular magnetization. And we use a titania to separate it in the magnetization so they can uh, decouple it. Okay. So now if we uh, Line that magnetization along this uh, this y direction, which is uh, perpendicular to the current direct uh, current direction, and uh, the measurement shows that uh, that uh, independent to the magnetization orientation, uh, this is a uh, uh, both so this uh, Lorentzian line shape and it's asymmetric with the magnetic field. Uh, also, uh, it is independent to the magnetization of this cobalt palladium. Okay, so this is a characteristic feature of the uh, inverse spin hole effect. However, when we uh, apply the magnetic field along this x direction, please keep in mind this x direction is uh, is parallel with this charge current direction, okay? So this is one feature of this uh, uh, in anomalous inverse spin core effect. And uh, when we had magnetization of the copper palladium point upwards, you see that uh, we again can see that uh, uh, spin charge conversion. However, when we flip the magnetization of the copper palladium to the down case, you see the spin charge conversion flipped is a sign. So this is also a characteristic feature of this anomalous inverse spin hole effect. Okay, we also compare this, the ratio of the uh, anomalous inverse spin hole effect with the inverse spin hole effect, which is about 6.3%. Okay, it is independence of the uh, frequency we used. We also perform this uh, 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 anomalous inverse spin hole effect as a function of uh, the magnetization orientation. Uh, we measure essentially measuring the uh, uh, hysteresis loop. And uh, we compare with that uh, hysteresis loop obtained with this, uh, this uh, uh, anomalous hole measurement. You see that uh, essentially they can they are same, the same figure. So anomalous inverse spin hole effect is linearly correlate, uh, correlated with the magnetization. So we observed that it's all these three feature, features of this anomalous inverse spin hole effect. This is clearly demonstrate of this uh, demonstration of this anomalous inverse spin hole effect. Okay, all features are observed. Okay, uh, in summary, I that uh, discuss with you this is a, a self-consistent method to determine, uh, determine the spin hole angle and spin diffusion lens. And I also um, and explain with you that uh, how to describe uh, this, uh, how to distinguish this inverse rush by NSA effect from this uh, IRE, uh, from the inverse spin hole effect. Okay, and I also show you that, uh, the features of this anomalous inverse spin hole effect. And uh, finally, I would like to uh, thank my collaborators. We had a long term collaboration with uh, 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 Beijing Normal University, uh, Fudan University, and also Nan University, some professors uh, in Fudan University, uh, Nan University. And in particular, I would like to mention this Professor. Uh, Bitanta, and also uh, we had a nice collaboration uh, results. And also, uh, 
had a collaboration with the Hong Kong University with Professor Xiangnan Wang at the University of Arizona. Professor uh, Su Feng Zhang also led the University of Federal at the Pernambuco, uh, Professor Azevedo. I would like to also thank the financial support from most and uh, NSFC and uh, thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, I think, for this uh, wonderful over overview of several important aspects of spin current physics. Uh, really, thank you so much. Excellent. I mean, okay, I thank you. Enjoyed, I'm sure all the audience have uh, enjoyed a lot. So I would uh, request you to stop sharing the screen and request everyone to switch on the uh, okay. camera so that we can take a group photo. And then we will come back to the uh, question answers. Let me uh, see how to uh, switch you off. You just stop sharing. That should uh, just stop sharing somewhere on the top. Uh, yes, we only, I, okay. Yeah, here we go. Excellent. So, uh, yeah. I would request everyone to switch on the camera. A lot of people have not switched on. Great, some more. So, all right. So we take picture now, smile. All right, very good. So uh, you may kindly turn off the camera and uh, hi Feng, I request you to share your screen again with your presentation. Okay. Oh, hello Yonko, very nice to have you here. Cool. Okay, so uh, there are already uh, two questions. Uh, uh, I think Puspendra, would you like to ask yourself? Yes, sir. Yeah, please. Starting part of your talk. So, so you have shown that uh, when there is a spin pumping, that time uh, line width increases as well as the intensity of the uh, fMR absorption decreases. Why it happening, sir? Oh, okay. Uh, because uh, you only have a constant power, and uh, uh, if you have more damping, uh, actually, that uh, if you uh, uh, do like the integration of the area, let's like, basically it essentially that uh, 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 your microwave power need to how much it uh, absorbed it, but uh, uh, let me put in this way. Go back to. And see, let's see. The, actually, uh, this is a typical feature because that uh, if you have more damping, actually that uh, magnetization processing actually will reduce, right? Yes. Uh, but uh, my question is uh, the intensity of absorption spectra why that decreases yeah. because just to con uh, maintain that area under the curve uh, okay let me quickly go back Uh, okay, so let me explain to you that uh, typically if you had uh, the same power, use the same power of the, um, uh, of the microwave, right? And then that uh, if you, uh, if the damping constant is large, and then that uh, uh, the spectrum, what you observed, actually the amplitude would be, Smaller. Let me put into the extreme case. 
if it's a subnet uh, all as a microwave, then that uh, um, they actually there would be no peak, right? The damping. Uh, the damping is uh, goes to very large. Then that you cannot uh, excite the uh, position. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, thanks, Kusmendra. I think Neha has a question. Neha, please unmute and ask. Good evening, sir. So my question is also from the same slide, this uh, where you have shown interface of bismuth and silver. Like you have said that when you increase the concentration of bismuth, then rush by effect vanishes. But this band structure is showing like band gap is vanishing. Yes, we can see. But is yeah. it uh, like Rashba also vanishes? How can we show? Like Rashba is splitting of bands. Uh, okay. So this... Uh, that uh, So this... That uh, one thing is that uh, you don't find clearly rush by band from this. You see this uh, band is very chaotic, right? Uh, and also that uh, you can also calculate it as, uh, this uh, uh, rush by constant. Uh, there's uh, one method uh, from this uh, band structure, you can calculate rush by constant. And actually I asked my friend, uh, they did uh, this calculation and found that this is uh, rush by band is almost vanishing. Okay. okay? Yes. And also it's, uh, this is, uh, depends on the uh, intermixing because uh, for the intermixing, uh, usually it's, uh, uh, the atoms are more randomized and uh, the interface is no longer sharp, right? And this is, uh, this is uh, uh, if you don't have a sharp interface, um, that uh, this uh, potential uh, gradient across the interface is no longer sharp. Uh, this potential difference, which is uh, very critical for the uh, rush bar. Yeah, it is uh, proportional to this potential difference. Okay, yes. Gradient, okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, I have actually a question uh, before I go to others uh, on the same thing. Uh, thanks, Maya, for asking because I had exactly the same question. Uh, well, um, we uh, we agree that um, there may be vanishing Raspa uh, splitting or Raspa states. I wonder this intermixing, is it uh, a very general thing for all the silver bismuth uh, interfaces or it is something special to your samples and or has others also found that there is intermixing? Uh, yeah, actually that uh, uh, bismuth is a material very common used in uh, semiconductor grows. It uh, uses it as a surfactant. So this is a bismuth atom is very mobile, I would say. So if you uh, for the uh, as a surfact, uh, surfactant uh, means that if you deposit more material, bismuth will float to the top. Okay, and so this bismuth is um, let me put it into this, the next slides. Okay, you see, if we look at on this, that uh, silver, you can see it's pretty much concentrated. For the nickel, it's also pretty much concentrated. But for bismuth, is, you pretty much found it everywhere, except it on the substrate. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, it's very it's, specific. Uh... Yeah, the cross-sectional DM image uh, clearly tells whatever you were explaining. Uh, I was just wondering, it's a very general thing, but yeah, maybe Bismuth is very mobile and it always... A very general thing. Uh, when we look at uh, uh, the first report, um, actually by uh, this, uh, not just uh, by the scientists and uh, in the uh, first, uh, professor first group, they also show this, uh, uh, TM, cross-section TM, uh, very similar results you can find. Okay, all right, then it's uh, kind of- This is very general for business. Okay, yeah. yeah. All right, thank you. Santos, you have a question, please unmute and ask. Hello, sir. 
am i audible yeah uh, so thank you sir for providing such a wonderful talk it was really insightful in uh, understanding the basics so actually i have a query that uh, in some cases the pure spin current that we observe is uh, it is sometimes contaminated by some other effects like uh, anomalous nurse defect or nurse defect itself so if you could please uh, comment yeah. on it and some methods to you know to rectify that or to reduce that uh, i didn't get your point but uh, let me uh, put in this way so let uh, let's uh, specific uh, geometry this is uh, what i pointed out so if you have a perpendicular IF field excitation and you, you're measuring at a positive or negative uh, a plus or minus 90 degree, and most of the rectification effect would go to the zero. And, uh, and however, there's a spin pumping signal, which is a, as either it's a positive for maximum or negative for maximum. So you just need to pick up the right geometry to perform your measurements. As I show you, uh, that's the raw data I put it, uh, show you. I didn't make any correction and essentially it shows up uh, Lorange uh, symmetric with the, as a function of the external field. So what are you measuring is essentially this uh, pure spin pumping signal. Okay, thank you. Uh, Manoj, probably the last question. Please unmute and ask. Thank you for the nice talk. Uh, my question is uh, related to this AG uh, Bismuth interface. I think we are here. So, uh, which is similar to earlier questions. Uh, I would like to know if there is any thickness dependence of bismuth or silver in this intermixing. And, if, uh, and also want to know if there is any driving force for this intermixing. Uh, can you repeat the, your question again? I didn't get you. Yes. Uh, I think one knows, maybe I can tell your, your voice is not very really clear. So yes. he's asking uh, if uh, there is any thickness dependence of these bismuth and silver layers on these uh, rasba ras states for the final result. Oh, okay. Uh, let's, uh, there's uh, one result I didn't uh, put into, uh, uh, forgot to add the slides in, okay? Um, there's one interesting part is that if this silver gets to very, very thin, and then there's, for instance, about one uh, third of monolayer of bismuth on silver, and you can find that there's, there's IRE effect uh, exists between this uh, bismuth and silver. Okay, this is only one <laughs> case. If we're staking, reverse the staking order of the bismuth and the silver, uh, let the, the signal reverse. So this is clearly tells you that, uh, that uh, less bismuth, actually, if you really want to work on that uh, bismuth, uh, silver uh, IRE effect, okay? So you have to use very small amount of bismuth, okay? Yes, yes. You one on one uh, monolayer of bismuth on top of it, then this kills this uh, rush bar band splitting. Yes. Okay. So, uh, and one follow-up question that uh, in the uh, in one of the previous questions that you are uh, answering, you mentioned that uh, you need a sharp interface. Uh, so, which means this, uh, even though we are saying that AG and BA, so, uh, you mean it is a kind of an alloy or the intermixing is throughout the uh, material. Is it so? Uh, actually, this is... Uh... A uh, very interesting uh, question. Uh, as I explained to you, that uh, if you look at uh, nickel and the bismuth, they also slightly intermixed. Yeah. And while at the uh, bismuth uh, silver, uh, the interface, if there's intermixing, um, then the, it immediately kills this uh, rush bar effect. 
because that uh, if you look at uh, uh, on a Fermi surface, actually it's dominated by the S electrons. And the uh, PZ uh, uh, electrons, however, if you look at uh, the nickel, uh, it is uh, dominated by the D electrons. So actually it's uh, not only uh, the material intermixing, uh, not only the material intermixing is important, but also that uh, if there's actually it's the sub interface of the electrons because uh, for bismuth and silver, it's this S electron is dominant, dominant. Yeah. and the okay. nickel uh, is D electrons is dominant. So if there's a slight intermixing, uh, it's, there's no problem with this wash bar. Okay. Yes. Okay, uh, I think we can go to the very last question, uh, Professor Muduli. Uh, hello. Uh, hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Uh, so I was I have a question related to the self uh, consistent determination of uh, spin hull angle. So yeah. uh, if we can go to that slide. Uh, yeah. Okay. Let me. I don't know how to turn off this. So I have to go back step by step. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, yes. So here actually there are about six uh, fitting parameters or maybe five, five no fitting parameters. Uh -huh. No fitting parameters, yeah. Yeah. So is it uh, because uh, uh, for example, this lambda, the spin diffusion and spin hull angle, they are multiplied with each other. And how how do you make sure that fitting works? Because oh. I, this uh, <laughs> this may fit for a different choice of the spin hull angle and uh, spin diffusion length, you know? Mm. Yeah, this is a very good uh, question. Uh, to be honest, on uh, at the beginning, I also don't trust the theory much, okay? Um, however, this model fits quite nicely. So let me explain to you. Okay, here is this spin hole angle and uh, on the latter part is the fitting error margin, okay? So it's uh, less than, it's around 10% difference, right? So it's pretty uh, much reliable. If I, for instance, uh, in the fitting, because I did this with my student, okay? I can uh, turn this uh, in whole angle goes to maybe goes to one or goes to zero uh, after a few iteration that it's automatically come back. So this fitting is pretty much reliable. And let me add in one more uh, explanation to that. Uh, if you look at, we had two equations, right? This is your concern. Well, this is uh, two equations. And uh, one is the G effective, one is the spin pumping voltage. However, you need to fit, okay, four parameters. Uh, if there's only, uh, this is, uh, uh, if you just uh, from the uh, first uh, thinking, it doesn't work. Okay, however, if you look at how many equations we have, because for each thickness, we have these two equations for the fitting. Okay, mm -hmm. it has to agree all the data together. So if we have for something like, uh, for instance, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, and 11. So we have something like uh, more than 20 equations to obtain these numbers, four numbers, okay? Mm -hmm. So, so one needs a lot of uh, samples actually to, in order to reliably determine these uh, parameters. Yeah, because mm -hmm. we, uh, these numbers has to be the one number for all these uh, uh, protein signals, yeah. All right. Uh, I think okay, thank we you. kind of uh, wrap up now. Uh, so it's getting late for uh, Sai Ming Ning, very um, almost close to midnight. So I would request you to uh, stop sharing the screen. I like to share my screen. Oh, okay. Yeah.
let me do it one more time. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. So uh, I hope you see my screen now. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay. okay. So on behalf oh. of the organizing team of uh, W2S seminar series, I'd like to present this uh, small digital memento uh, in appreciation of your great talk. I would like to read it. The W2S seminar webinar series on Spintronics, National Institute of Science, Education and Research, that is NICER Bhubaneswar in India. Takes pleasure in presenting this black to Professor Hai Feng Ding from Nanjing University in China. In recognition and appreciation for being a valuable speaker to give a lecture on fundamental aspects of your speed correct. Thank you so much again, uh, I think. Thank you. So, so kind of you to give this lecture so late in the night. And thank you guys uh, for joining. We meet same time next week, uh, 8 p.m. Indian time uh, for the lecture of Dr. Sijani Mollik from Thales Laboratories. She has done some wonderful work recently on CUDEX uh, and uh, some novel superconductivity phenomena from that. And uh, the over next week, that will be the 17th of November, I like to just advertise, we will have the 100th lecture uh, by Professor Stuart Parkin. But that will be a little bit different time. That will be 4 p.m. Indian time, that is uh, like 11.30 a.m. in Central European time. So I, we will send the notice in due course of time, but I just try to inform. Stay tuned and please join. And uh, I think it is very interactive session to students, colleagues, and we are all learning. Thank you so much again. All of you, good night. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Okay. Have a nice yeah. evening. Bye bye. Yeah, take care. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Hi, Fang. Bye.